I'm Aram Sinreich. I'm a media professor at Rutgers University. Um, and most of what I cover is about the intersection of tech, culture, law, and policy. Uh, the book that I just finished writing, which is available online right now under a Creative Commons license, is called The Piracy Crusade at, the pir at piracycrusade.com. And it'll be published uh, next year by University of Massachusetts Press uh, in, in traditional paper form. I'm Ray Beckerman. I'm a, a longtime uh, commercial litigation lawyer in New York. And uh, my practice has always included uh, many communications issues, including uh, copyright, trademark, libel, slander. And uh, in the, about 2004, I started trying to help people who were being uh, sued by the recording industry, the big four record labels especially. And uh, I set up a blog to help uh, lawyers uh, share information. And uh, by setting up that blog, uh, I unfortunately became uh, sort of a leader in a field that I almost wish I had never gotten involved in because of course, it's always a mismatch when these big companies are suing individuals, but uh, I, I grew up in South Ozone Park, Queens, which is a tough neighborhood, and I grew up there during uh, the era of gang warfare, and I was very accustomed to, being, to, to, to bullies and, and to seeing bullies at work. I was one of the only Jewish people there, and uh, who, one of the only people who didn't belong to a gang, so... Um, when I see bullying, I recognize it instantly, and I can't uh, stay away from fighting it. Uh, I also represent uh, websites and companies that are being attacked by those, uh, re the, recording, uh, the recording industry, the motion picture industry, and, uh, um, and I, uh, general commercial law. And uh, the whole idea is uh, how do we use our backgrounds in law or public policy to make better policy, better laws for New York City and New York State and the country. And uh, does anyone know about uh, what happened with a small app called Uber? Uber. So uh, today it was announced that there's a, a company that created an app and um, has anyone ever wished that they could catch a cab in New York City? Oh, yeah. And so, wouldn't it be really cool if there was an app for that? Well, there is. It's called Uber. It's in San Francisco and it works. They tried to do it in New York City for six months. And after six months of trying and failing because of New York City's uh, regulatory framework that is unfair to startups and entrepreneurs, we don't have it. They, they have said, they've thrown up their hands, they are walking away. And after the fact, New York City is saying, Come back in February, maybe we'll have a, a place that will be friendly to startups, friendly to disruptive technology companies that want to change the way in which we travel around New York City. Uh, there's an economic impact to that. We lost the business that they would have brought, the uh, tax revenues, the people they would have hired. We also lost being able to get around the city faster. I, I know I never can get a cab whenever I want to. Is it, I'm assuming that is a, a familiar experience. So part of having somebody who's running for office who has an event at the Hive at 55 and wants to reach out to the incubator community and the startup community and is a Drupal developer and understands what free software is and open source is and has his own Linux box and you name it, is somebody who actually speaks the language, understands what's going on and can see when our laws and policies are broken. And uh, one of the reasons I asked uh, these two speaker, distinguished speakers to come is because uh, I'm going to ask Ray to talk a little bit about the problem, uh, especially in digital copyright law, and the situation where few people are looking at it and saying, if a company is suing its customers, there, there might be something wrong. So I'd love Ray to talk a little bit about the problem and how it got there and why it's there and how it started to be fought and uh, I, I, I'm hoping that uh, Mr. Sinreich can uh, expound on just the culture and policy and, and how we got here and uh, if all, all of us can start talking about ways to stem the tide, change the dialogue <coughs> and repair 
a, a system that can both reward intellectual property and intellectual rights and pursuits and convince people that it's worth investing in at, at the same time as not thwarting uh, competition and the marketplace. So uh, Ray, you have the floor. Well, <clears throat> once we had uh, digitalization and, and the internet, uh, it created a world in which uh, the great gatekeepers, the giant corporations through which people needed to go in order to communicate uh, their artistry or their creations uh, was taken away. Um, there was a time when an artist could either work for tips or else they had to get signed by a record label. There was a time when a, a, a person who wanted to do video or, or movie had to, go, had to go through motion picture studios. And in order to publish books, you had to go through big publishing companies. And digitalization and the internet has now taken away those entry barriers that, that previously existed. Uh, so the very, instead of concentrating their efforts on um, competing in that world and thinking how they could take their treasure trove of content and market it in, in fun and, and profitable ways on the internet, they instead concentrated on trying to sweep it under the rug and pretend it was going to go away. And then the very same executives who missed the boat and failed to realize the great opportunity that the internet was, those same executives are still in charge of those same companies. So looking for a scapegoat, they blamed it on, uh, they blamed their loss of profits on people copying their stuff, which is only a small part of their problem. And they tried to pretend that every time anything is ever downloaded without being paid for, that that would have been a purchase and sale even though everybody who has studied this has found out that that's, that's not the case. So the record industry went on this uh, torrent, torrent of lawsuits. They first tried to use the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and Verizon stood up to them, the Electronic Frontier Foundation stood up to them about it, and the courts said, where, where is, are you entitled to be uh, using the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to, to attack peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing and to get to serve subpoenas and things. You have to sue people and you have a lawsuit, then you can bring a subpoena. So what they did was they would bring mass lawsuits against John Doe's and they knew nothing about these John Doe's except that they had paid for an internet access account that was allegedly used at a certain date and time to download something through something either on the Nutella or the Fast Track protocol. Now they started this mass lawsuit wave in the 2003, right around the time that BitTorrent was becoming the favorite file sharing method of everybody who was a sophisticated or high volume of file sharer. And they never went, in, in all the years of their lawsuit, uh, campaign, they never went against anyone using BitTorrent. They didn't even have an idea about how to go after that. And they didn't know how to find downloads. They called them downloading cases. But in fact, these weren't, they didn't know anything about downloads. They only knew that a person's, that they believed that a person's computer was, was sharing. And um, the identifications were terrible. It, they, and they had high error rates. The identification did not identify a, um, a copyright infringer. They just identified a person who paid for an in internet access. I had w one case where a chauffeur who didn't even own it, he'd never had a computer, was uh, being targeted. Had another case where it was a home health aide who had paid the phone bill, but she had actually never used the, there was a, there was, she believed, a computer in the house. She wasn't even sure because she didn't actually know what a computer was. She wasn't sure if it was the monitor or the other part or the combination. All she had ever done with the computer was dust around it. 
and she didn't even know how to turn it on. She wouldn't even have known what button to turn on, and she was being sued. And in fact, it was um, in the case against this poor woman who worked for $8 an hour cleaning bedpans. Uh, it was in her case that I first heard the name Aram Sinright because I quickly, I, I, I had a situation where I, I told the Electronic Frontier Foundation I needed an expert witness on the media industry who could uh, say what the actual price was of a download. And uh, they recommended Aram and Professor Sinright was gracious enough to do it and, and uh, put in, the, and that was the first time I ever heard of him. I never even met him at that moment, but uh, it was in that case. But these cases were lunatic, crazy cases, and the, the RIA was um, bringing these John Doe cases. So the way the John Doe cases work is they would sue Verizon, let's say, in Washington, D.C., and all they were looking for was the names of these John Doe's. So John Doe gets a letter. John Doe is someone who's in San Francisco, let's say. So he's being sued 3,000 miles away. He goes to a lawyer and says, well, what can I do? The lawyer says, well, maybe you can make a motion to quash the subpoena. But I can't do it. It has to be a lawyer in Washington, D.C. So how am I supposed to, how is the person in San Francisco supposed to get a lawyer in Washington, D.C.? And then, oh, what about the motion to quash? I mean, is, is there any likelihood it'll be, Will it cost me money? Of course, you've got to pay legal fees. And is there any likelihood it'll be granted? I don't know, because I don't know of any basis for a motion to quash the subpoena. And it's very possible that if I requisitioned the file, I still wouldn't know the basis for a motion to quash the subpoena. I certainly wouldn't know if it would be granted. So people were unable to cope with these things, and the courts didn't understand the technology, didn't understand what was going on, and believed the RIA lawyers who were willing to lie at every turn. They would put in affidavits. And their, and their witnesses. Hmm? <clears throat> and their witnesses. Even their lawyers. I, I had a case where the lawyer put in a brief that the metadata on the file proves that this was illegally downloaded, which it, it proved nothing of that kind. But the judge, who was about 90 years old and senile and arrogant, uh, accepted, accepted that representation from a lawyer without any evidence and without giving anybody an opportunity to uh, rebut it in any way. So these, cra these crazy lawsuits have, have gone on and the RIA was probably being investigated in New York for several things because they were using unlicensed investigators and um, there were several different things that were tr very troubling under New York law. There was antitrust possibilities, etc. So I don't know, but all I know is that one day it was announced by the by by Cuomo that that he was um, that the, that the RIA had agreed to stop bringing new cases, but no, but there was no statement about what they were doing in Cuomo's office and what it had to do with New York State or anything. So it's, it's all a mystery, but they eventually slowed down and stopped. And then um, picking up on their cases was, the, was these small motion pictures. Now this is not the MPAA. At first there were some independent pictures like a Hurt Locker, like regular small pictures. And then all of a sudden the porn makers realized that this was that this was the real place to make money with porn movies because when you have a defendant who's a John Doe and they're, they're, they're afraid to have their name exposed, even if they're innocent or, 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 or if they did it. I mean, the, the copyright liability is almost secondary in these cases because of the, it's the fear of being associated with downloading pornography. So a whole new wave following the RIA model has been brought and it's a different model in some ways only because the, it's like lawyer driven rather than driven by the actual maker. These are like pure copyright troll cases where the lawyers are, are troll. In fact, it's funny because several times I have been approached by them. So I know what their deal is. They, 
they all have these big contingent fees, like the lawyers get maybe 75% of the recovery. And they split, like the lawyer who's got the big thing then gets other lawyers to handle it in different states and gives them a half of, of whatever he would get. And it's all lawyer driven and, and contingent fee based. And it's like so sorted, uh, horrendous, and people are being sued all over the place in these and, and in even higher volume. Now, starting in 2005 when I started my blog, Recording Industry Versus the People, I started talking about all the legal niceties that were being ignored. And I wrote an article in the ABA Judges Journal about why they should, in 2008, about, what, about 15 different ways the judges are neglecting to enforce the law and allowing these big companies to just run rampant over to federal courts and made suggestions for how the cases could be handled more fairly. And I don't know, you know whether that had any effect or not, uh, but in the RIA cases, um, it eventually petered out after Governor Cuomo's uh, announcement. But um, in these cases now, the judges seem to have finally woken up to some of those procedural infirmities. It may be that it was the pornography thing that got their attention, that they finally started getting sick about it. But they started realizing that the, the, they shouldn't be allowed to bring a mass John Doe case. And the majority of judges are now severing it and saying, if you're suing John Doe's one through 300, two through, th two through 300 have to be severed and dismissed. You have to bring a separate case for each one of them and pay a separate $350 filing fee for each one of them. And so the judges That's are starting. Money. That's real money. <laughs> it is. And so those judges are starting to get wise, maybe. But I wouldn't be too optimistic about it because as in, uh, in the courts, as in the legislature, which uh, Aaron will probably touch on, uh, there are... In the copyright world, there are the artist interests, there are the consumers and the interests of the public, and there are the, the, the interests of owners of copyright. And you will see that when legislation is done, the artists are not really represented, the consumers are not represented at all, the public interest is not represented at all, and the only ones that are interested are that, are, that have, a, have a voice in our government are giant corporations that have bought the interests from the creators and uh, exploited the creators and they're the owners and they have the power. And it shouldn't be that way in court and the court is like probably the, the least like that of, of the branches of government. But unfortunately, it's very much like that, and judges tend to show undue deference to big corporations. So um, now I'll turn it over to Aram, and he, he, he can explain the theory behind it and how we got into this predicament. Thanks, Ray, and thank you for all the work that you've done. It's, it's, it's really inspiring. You know, it, it's not an exaggeration to say that without Ray Beckerman, um, the state of American... Uh, our understanding of the civil liberties issues brought up by the what I call the piracy crusade would be uh, drastically impoverished. So, thank you for doing the work that you do. I really appreciate that. Um, so, I'm debating whether to give you guys a little background on me. I'll give you the, the kind of two minute version. Um, I started out working for the major labels and for the film industry. I was, back in the 1990s, during the dot-com years, the dot-com 1.0 years, I was an analyst for a firm here in New York uh, on what was then called Silicon Alley, uh, called Jupiter Communications. And my job was to figure out um, how new technologies were changing uh, existing businesses. Spe specifically, in my case, the business of media and entertainment. And uh, I was, I, you know, I'm a music lover, I'm a musician, all I ever wanted to do was make music, be near music, s surround my life with music. So I thought being a, a, a man in his early 20s in New York uh, and being able to advise you know, these companies that I've looked up to for my entire life was pure heaven. Uh, so I, and I was 
I, to my knowledge, the first person, for instance, uh, to advocate in research, in published research, for the use of DRM by uh, the entertainment industry. DRM, for those of you who don't know, is a kind of digital padlock that uh, companies sometimes use to prevent you from doing what you want with, uh, with the, the content that you access uh, through legal means. And um, short, the, the month that I published the report, advocating DRM use by the entertainment industry in uh, June of 1999. Uh, this guy named Sean Fanning, uh, who's a college student up in Boston, released a piece of software to his friends. It was not a commercial release called Napster. And at the time that Napster was released, the RIAA, the Recording Industry Association of America, estimated that there were 500,000 MP3s on the internet. And this was a major crisis. And that was, that was a talking point in my DRM report. Oh my god, there's already 500,000 MP3s on the internet. We've got to contain this thing. You guys have to lock it down. Um, and then uh, within a few months of Napster's release, there were uh, hundreds of millions of songs available via the service freely to anybody who could choose. So the toothpaste was out of the tube, the genie was out of the bottle, it became instantly obvious to anybody who paid attention to this stuff that the concept that the internet is a controllable medium, functionally speaking, uh, forget about law and policy for a second, just from a technological standpoint, the notion that you could create an electronic fence around the information on the internet was blown completely out of the water. It was gone. It was over. So my Again, trying to be the good boy, trying to you know, work for my clients and tell the music industry what they should do next. My focus became, uh, what does the media industry look like in a post-Napster world? Uh, and I fielded some research and I said, well, first of all, let's find out what this thing is doing. You know, uh, is Napster causing people to buy less music because they're getting it for free? And I fielded this big survey of thousands and thousands of Americans, and uh, it had a bunch of different questions on it. One of the questions was, have you increased or decreased the amount you're spending on music in the last year? And another question was, have you ever used this thing called file sharing? And when I did a regression analysis, which is a statistical tool that means X causes Y, it doesn't just mean that they correlate, it means that there's a causal relationship. When we did a regression analysis, what we found was that Napster users were much more likely to have increased the amount of money they were spending on music in the last year than anybody else, any other music fans on the internet, by a factor of 45%. And that was controlling for age, for income, for geography, for anything you could think of. In fact, Napster usage was the number one predictor of somebody spending more money on music. So I run breathlessly to my clients. It's like that scene in The Right Stuff, that movie, where they, they launched Sputnik. I run up to them and I'm like, oh my god, it's the best thing. You guys have to know. This thing, Napster, it's great. You guys should partner with them. You should buy them. This is the best thing that ever happened to you. And they were like, no. And I said, well, but you, did you, they said, no, no, this is terrible for us. This is, this is taking away our, our, our money. These people are pirates. We have to stomp on them. And I said, but don't you understand? It's just, and they started to get very upset at me. And in fact, it got to the point where not only did the RIAA stop being my clients, um, but they would publish press releases refuting my research when my research was published. Uh, and then when I would refute their refutations, they would say things like, Me thi we think Mr. Sinreich doth protest too much. Um, like I was making a big deal out of their making a big deal out of my findings. Um, so that started me down the path of wondering, what's up with these people? Why don't they want to make money? Like, what seriously, what's their problem? Why can't they accept what seems obvious to me and to any other 20-something who's interested in tech and culture uh, and, and change their business practices in a way that's going to enable the uh, proliferation of content uh, and, uh, and make money from it. And obviously now, in, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that there are many ways that that can be done and has been done, um, many of which we were discussing back in 1999 and 2000. Um, and so I left uh, the corporate world and I went into academia because I was interested in, first of all, in being able to address those questions without getting angry phone calls from my clients, and second of all, trying to kind of dope out the story behind the story, figure out you know, what took us to this point where there seems to be such a, an immense uh, impasse between the obvious direction in which technology and culture are co-evolving and the processes and laws by which uh, businesses are run. 
So let me answer those questions really briefly, and then hopefully that can take us into a, a conversation. The root of all evil uh, is not, as Karl Marx said, uh, money, although it's related. The root of all evil is the concept that ideas are property what we commonly call intellectual property in law, although there's no legal definition for that term. Um, this is an idea that has been around for half a century, and it, in, in some ways, was a very necessary idea. And it came about, as some of you probably know, because of this uh, development called movable type and the printing press. And all of a sudden, it used to be that you know when music was played, it was there and then it was gone. And when somebody told a story, it was there and it, then it was gone. And if you wanted to copy the Bible, you had to have some monks up in a monastery with gold ink copying it letter for letter and word for word. And that's the way it worked for thousands of years. And then movable type comes around and all of a sudden, you have an idea, boom, you can copy it a million times and send it out to a million people. And that was a very scary idea to governments because and to churches. Um, for, for reasons that soon became obvious with the Protestant Reformation, with the Age of Enlightenment, with, the, um, with what we would now call uh, the democratic revolutions of the 18th century, right? Those could not have happened without the printing press. Um, so right around the time that our country was born, there was this new idea, which was that, um, well, it's complex, but the basic version is that we could create this thing called copyright, and copyright would be good because it would harness the power of the bourgeoisie to put a check on the power of the government. Because through the mechanism of the marketplace, we would all be able to, um, to share information in such a way that the top-down kind of hierarchical information sharing uh, would no longer be possible. And you know, there could be a thousand different publishers and a million different readers, um, <coughs> all subsidizing those publishers you know, tuppence at a time. And that was really constituent of American democracy, and that's the reason that the Constitution uh, in the U.S. sets out, you know, in Article One of the Constitution, Section 8, sets out the premise for copyright. Um, now, there was always a trade-off. The trade-off was that in exchange for this kind of democratization of cultural power, there would have to be an enforcement mechanism that would encourage organizations and individuals to invest in sharing that. Uh, with the expectation that they would be remunerated through the marketplace. And remember, the market is that check and balance against the unified power of the state. Um, so they created this thing called copyright and said, for a very limited amount of time, you guys can uh, have a, a monopoly over this idea. But then when that runs out, everybody will get the idea. Um, and we can all do what we want with it. As uh, Lawrence Lessig, the law professor, has pointed out to us for the last decade or so, that idea kind of went awry as capitalism developed from a very kind of organic, horizontal process to a much more agglomerated, hierarchical process. And what eventually happened is that copyright uh, got longer and longer and more and more powerful and spread out to a functional infinity. Um, and also became a multinational platform rather than a, a US, a, than a sovereign platform. Um, and that was echoed in the consolidation of the media industries uh, to the point where today we have three major record labels who control 80% of the market. Uh, we have you know, five major film studios. We have uh, you know, four, now three major music publishers. Um, basically every aspect of the media and communications industry is controlled by a handful of giant conglomerates that are actually larger and more powerful than most governments. So the checks and the balances against government power have themselves usurped government power and become just as uh, one-sided in their ability to determine the flow of information between people and throughout society. And that has been augmented by the fact that our communications technologies have become orders of magnitude more powerful. So now they can actually reach into our homes, into our private lives, into our interpersonal communications and tell us we own the ideas that you are trying to share with uh, the people in your life. And that has happened at exactly the moment that the growth of digital uh, communications and information sharing has led to a revolution in the structure of ideas that is tantamount to what the printing press did 500 years earlier. Um, there is no longer informatic scarcity. Once an idea has been expressed, it is universally, more or less universally accessible. There are over two billion people with internet access. There are over six billion mobile phone accounts in the world. 
six billion, there are only seven billion human beings on the planet, right? So once information enters the digital sphere, it is universally accessible. And so all of these business models and all of these laws and policies that are premised on the notion that information is scarce. Remember, copyright is the right to copy. Well, what does the right to copy mean when expression itself is fundamentally uh, indistinguishable from the act of copying, right? When the act of speaking and the act of copying are one and the same instantaneously and universally, the concept of copyright either goes out the window or else it becomes the right to speak, right? And controlling the right to speak is fascism, right? It's, in, it's inimical to democracy. It's the antithesis of what copyright was supposed to be when it was created. So what we really need to strive for, not only as an, a, a nation, but as, uh, as a human society around the globe, is to develop a new set of checks and balances that maximize the power of individuals to create and share and access information um, without any single uh, entity, whether it's governmental or corporate, being able to stop us from doing that. And that's, that's the spirit of copyright, which I believe should be alive and well today. So how did we get to this terrible point? Um, part of it is uh, that, uh, that intellectual property and politics have become very deeply entwined. And politics and communications have always been entwined, which is why they were afraid of movable type in the first place. Um, but if you look, for instance, and I, I, I'm only going to skate the surface here, but it's important to point out that and again, Lawrence Lessig is beginning to get into this, and he's doing a very good job of, of bringing this kind of thought uh, to people. Um, but there need to be more people talking about this. Um, the process of lobbying, the process by which corporate interests influence the laws and policies that determine the course of our lives, has, has uh, become overwhelmingly influential in, in lawmaking uh, in recent years. Um, and one of the most lobbied issues in the world is intellectual property. The copyright industries and uh, the copyright industries, which is music, film, publishing, and software, have spent $2.4 billion just on campaign finance and lobbying between 1989 and 2001. And the number one issue that they lobby on is IP, what they call IP reform, which always means strengthening intellectual property laws. Um, if you look at IP lobbying across all sectors, in three years, from 2009 to 2011, in the U.S. alone, there were $2.5 billion spent just on creating laws like SOPA and PIPA and CISPA and um, international treaties like ACTA and CETA. Um, and as a result, we've seen this creeping... Uh, level of control to censor and to surveil individual speech um, at the governmental and at the corporate level uh, at home and around the world. And we'll talk about, it, you know, internationally, the U.S. interests largely have promoted even more um, draconian laws than they can get away with uh, here at home. So, for instance, in Spain, um, you're Spanish. No, you're Spanish. La Ley Cinde Right, which is a law that was entirely written by and lobbied for by U.S. commercial interests that gives corporations the ability to get personal information about suspected copyright infringers, which they're not allowed to do in the U.S., um, was, was enacted at gunpoint. The U.S. Uh, trade representatives said that we're going to put you on the special 301 report, basically the most wanted list um, that rescinds your trade status unless you enact this law. And the Spanish government said, no, 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 we're not going to do it. And then the U.S. put them on the list. And within 10 days, the Spanish legislature passed the law, right? They didn't have time to write a law. They just took what the U.S. wrote, and they signed it, and they put it into law, because otherwise, Spain would be in even deeper economic shit than it's in now. Um, and that kind of coercion is the antithesis of democratic rule. And the kinds of policies that are passed under those kinds of coercive coercive circumstances are also inimical to self-democracy. Now, the new Spanish government is making, uh, rattling its sword and saying they're going to push back against La Ley Cinde. Um, but to my knowledge, that hasn't happened legislatively yet. Now, in Switzerland, um, where you're from, they had a similar um, movement. Um, and the Swiss government actually commissioned a report saying, well, how important is this piracy stuff anyway? And what they found out was, if you look at the macroeconomic situation, 
allowing people to freely share information over the internet has a net positive economic impact. And to the extent that it has a negative economic impact, it negatively impacts a handful of American companies who don't contribute to the Swiss economy anyway. So the Swiss government has actually, even though it has very strong anti-piracy laws on the books, has unilaterally decided that it will not enforce those laws. And that was a decision made within the last year or so. Um, so it's very interesting to look at how this is playing out with, in, with respect to international relations. Um, inside of the US, we're also increasingly seeing the government play a role in the process of intellectual property. Uh, a recent law signed into law by, by President Obama appoints uh, what is um, uh, informally called a copyright czar, a woman named Victoria Espinel, who used to work as the assistant US trade representative, the people who forced Spain at gunpoint to, to adopt this law. And she was actually in charge of, of more uh, rogue uh, territories like India and, and uh, China and Russia, basically bringing them to justice. Um, and what she's done already in her short time in power was to secretly negotiate a deal between the ISP, the major broadband ISPs, and Hollywood that will force, even though in, in a lot of countries, uh, for instance in Europe, they have what's known as three strikes laws. For instance, France Hadopi, France's Hadopi law, which says if you are accused of violating intellectual property three times, you get kicked off the internet, which by the way is, according to the UN, a, a fundamental human right access to the internet. So you will be deprived of your fundamental human rights if you are accused, not proven, not convicted, if you are accused of violating intellectual property three times. Now they haven't managed to pass that, although they've tried in the US. So what the US government did was they, they went to Hollywood and they said, hey, we can make this happen without going through legislation. And they went to the ISPs and they said, you know what, we're going to regulate the fuck out of you if you don't play ball with Hollywood. So let's they all got together in a big hotel in California and they worked it out and now we have what's known as a six strike policy in the US that went into effect this summer and Verizon has announced that they're going to begin sending out the first wave of first strike emails to their subscribers next month in November. So we are now living under the same get kicked off the internet for being suspected of violating intellectual property. Uh, within the US that they're experiencing elsewhere around the world. And that was brokered by a federally appointed, non-elected, non-mandated uh, individual who has background in industry rather than in government. Um, and if you look Let at the- Let me just interject one thing. Please. Um, um, about a month ago, I re we were consulted by someone who received first notice I've seen of that type from Comcast. Yep. So Comcast is already sending them out. Really? That's interesting. And yeah, Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, all of the major broadband ISPs covering about 99% of U.S. internet households have voluntarily signed on to this accord. Um, the U.S. is also negotiating and taking the lead role in negotiating international treaties uh, like ACTA that would raise the bar for surveillance and censorship of online communications um, internationally at the behest of, of uh, a handful of IP uh, interests. And these negotiations have been conducted completely in secret. In fact, not even US legislators have had access to draft versions of these treaties. But you know who has? The RAAA and the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America, they've been invited to consult as industry uh, consultants uh, about what the contents of these policies should be even though our elected officials have not. And the, the Obama administration has said that it's fast-tracking ACTA, and only because um, some of the EU countries that had signed it re later refused to ratify it after massive demonstrations of tens and even hundreds of thousands of people in the street in countries like Spain and Poland, after they refused to ratify it, um, it's, it's, been, it's kind of taken a back seat for the moment. But this is something that's, that's happening very quickly. Uh, IP also disrupts the political process in some very frightening ways. For instance, the DMCA, which, uh, which Ray was talking about, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, which was enacted 14 years ago, and at the time seemed very draconian and now seems very tame by comparison, has something called a notice and takedown function, which means that if you believe someone is hosting a file that infringes your intellectual property, you can tell them to take it down, and they have to do it 
until somebody appeals and says, wait, I wasn't infringing, right? It's guilty until proven innocent. Um, and these, that is very dangerous when you're in a time-sensitive situation, such as an election. So both uh, marketing videos for the Obama campaign and for the, uh, the um, uh, Romney campaign have been taken off of YouTube because of bogus DMCA takedown notices. So there was Obama singing, uh, there, was, there was Romney singing uh, his song, and there was Obama singing his song, and there was Michelle Obama's DNC speech, um, and they were all subject to DMCA takedowns. Um, not because they legitimately violated intellectual property, which they can't because we have something in the U.S. under copyright law called fair use that says if you're using something for political communication, it is largely insulated against, uh, against claims of infringement. Um, but because there's a mechanism to censor things without recourse that was put in place that is perfect for censoring political speech. So uh, this is completely separate from content ID? That is correct. These are, these are, these are complaint-driven rather than algorithmically driven notice and takedowns. And you don't have to identify who the noticer of the takedown is, right? So it's unclear what the political, uh, it's clear what the political motivations are, but it's unclear who the political actors are in. Do, do we know if counter notices have been filed? Um, it, well, I don't think there's time for that. It takes right. months, sure. right? So I, I, I don't know whether they filed counter notices, but even if they did, they wouldn't be able to put these videos back on before the election. Yeah. And more importantly, you know, they tend to hit videos when they're trending. So you go from like 50,000 views to 10 million views in a couple of days. If you want to stop it from getting to 100 million views, what do you do? You file a notice and take down, and then boom, nobody can see the video anymore. Uh, and it's, it's been very effective. Um, so let me briefly talk about some of the uh, alternatives that are out there. Um, I talked about you know the Swiss government's decision to basically you know say to the U.S. You want to put us on the, the the 301 list? Fine, put us on the 301 list. You know we'll we'll be rogues. Um, we've seen uh, the free software and open software movement. Richard Stallman, who I believe is going to be speaking at uh, one of Mr. Uh, Callis's uh, events. Is, um, was the father of what's known as copy left, which basically says, I'm going to use my copyright powers to ensure that everybody has to make my ideas available to everybody else. Um, we've seen Creative Commons, which was Lawrence <coughs> Lessig's attempt to take that idea and apply it to cultural ideas like music and paintings and, and books. Um, my new book, by the way, is licensed under Creative Commons. Um, we've seen some interesting ideas coming out of uh, Holland which is um, where a, a guy named Joost Smears, uh, who wrote a, a, a very influential article called Imagine There's No Copyright um, and No Something Else Too, I forget what the something, and, and No Intellectual Property Too. Um, they suggest getting rid of copyright altogether and creating what's known as an usufruct system, which is kind of a, a weird word, but it's been around for thousands of years, and it basically means a very temporary licensed monopoly in place of the kind of own it for, for functional infinity that copyright represents. There's a now international pirate party that has dozens of, um, of countries with active chapters, and they have a, an entire political platform that uh, involves rolling back a lot of copyright's most extreme measures. Um, within the US, we have a bipartisan initiative between uh, one of the most right-wing senators, Daryl Issa, and uh, one of the most left-wing, Ron Wyden, to um, create um, a digital bill of rights that would basically say no matter what new IP uh, it, uh, laws are written, they have to live up to a, a basic level of respecting uh, civil liberties, free speech, freedom uh, from intrusion, freedom of privacy, um, that uh, freedom from surveillance, that um, would, would limit the scope of these kinds of laws. Um, it hasn't passed, obviously. They, they also created something called the Open Act, that would have ratified the Digital Bill of Rights. Um, there have been, uh, down in Brazil, a bill that would have penalized companies for using DRM uh, to prevent fair use. Um, so there are all kinds of very interesting ideas on the table, and all that it takes is the legislative will to overcome the tremendous power of this billion dollars a year in lobbying and finance, uh, uh, campaign finance in the US alone notwithstanding the rest of the world and the more under the table kinds of transactions that happen. And in order to achieve that, in order to develop that political will at the legislative level, we really need people like 
Ben, who um, are independent thinkers who are not in the pockets of these industries and who have a fundamental understanding of the role that these new technologies play in the growth of culture and the growth of industry. Uh, that's something I haven't talked uh, quite enough about, and let me wrap things up by talking about what's, what's at stake for us in bringing people like him into legislators, whether it's at the city level, the state level, or the federal level. Um, if you think about it, this is really just the beginning, right? Because the, as much as the lines between physical and digital have already blurred, they're only going to blur with increasing rapidity in the years that come. We're already beginning to see, for instance, I just went to Maker Faire a few weeks ago out in uh, Queens, and there were three full pavilions that were only 3D printers, right? And for those of you who don't know, a 3D printer is just like a regular printer, except it can print objects, any kind of object you want, mostly out of polymers, although people have printed foods and all kinds of interesting other stuff. Um, but right now, copyright law does not cover 3D designs. Um, and that is something that is probably going to change at the behest of vested interests. What if you know, a part of your car breaks and you can just print out a new piece for your car without going to the dealership to, to get a piece of it? What if instead of printing out, uh, going to Ikea and buying a bookshelf, you can just print out uh, an identical bookshelf and assemble it in your home without ever driving to the store? Right? Those kinds of issues, which, which are, are going to enable so much innovation and so much industry, are terrifying to the vested interests who require you to go to a place and get a physical object. The same way that uh, Ray was talking about file sharing being terrifying to the companies that required you to go to a place and get an information object. Um, and that's only the beginning. We're beginning to, to create, um, uh, you know, if you look at nanotechnologies, if you look at biotechnology, we are beginning to unravel the sequence of human life and the sequence at the subatomic level of uh, existence itself. And within a relatively short amount of time in terms of the scope of human history, we will be able to build whatever we want, anytime and anywhere we want, with any kinds of materials. And if those kinds of actions are controlled from the top down, then everything we think, everything we say, everything that we are, everything that our body consists of, will be owned by someone, and they will have the right to prevent us from being and doing and saying and going where we want and what we want. And that is a terrifying dystopian future to consider. So last thing I'll say is New York City is the epicenter of these ideas right now, right? It used to be Silicon, it was Silicon Alley for a while, then all the money shifted out into Silicon Valley. New York has been growing in terms of investment in new technologies faster than any other region in the world. Where every place else in the US, California, the whole West Coast, everywhere else has been down for the last few years. VC money, venture capital, has been up 32% in the last four years in, in the US. Tech jobs have been up 29% in New York in the last four years. Um, and we need people who are going to pave the way for that to continue to happen. And that is why I've uh, spent the evening here with you guys talking about this instead of at home reading to my kids and tucking them into bed. Thank you. Th thank both of you. Speaking of terrifying, I was working on a case uh, recently where uh, it's Capitol Records versus Redigi. And uh, Redigi uh, has um, technology which enables people to actually resell uh, MP3 files that were purchased, or MP3 type files that were purchased uh, through iTunes. And it had the technology to verify um, w whether it's it's the exact same one that was downloaded, uh, so that it so that there can't be uh, more than one of, of the exact copy. So it actually has better uh, ways of protecting against copying than any other digital technology. I mean, CDs you could make your own CDs, you could uh, copy them to your hard drive, you, you could do them repeatedly, but but with in, in this in this system, there can only be one that ever went through. So if anybody ever made a copy of, of, an, of, an, of an iTunes MP3, it could not go through twice. So, um, you know, instead of uh, recognizing this technology and 
realizing that it could actually help uh, the, the record industry, uh, their, they followed their immediate reflex, which was to file a lawsuit against it. They, um, it's, it's, in, it's in Manhattan in the Southern District, and they, uh, when I was working on the case, the Capitol Records made a motion for a preliminary injunction uh, to try to shut it down, and that, that motion was denied. And then uh, after uh, my firm left the case, a, a new firm is handling it, and motions for summary judgment were made and were argued recently and are, are now pending. Uh, but this, this is the uh, record industry model to just uh, keep uh, fighting everything. So I, I think part of it is, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions, is just changing the dialogue. We, we have this opportunity where we have investments in technology in, in the next wave. We're here at the Hive at 55 because it is an incubator because it represents this campaign's investments in our future, our investments in new technology. Uh, so much of what the two speakers said res resonates with me. And what I can tell you, having been a chief of staff in the New York State Assembly, is that these bad laws aren't necessarily happening because uh, legislators are bad people or executives are bad people. It's because they don't know any better. And part of what got me activated was, uh, I, was in, I was an attorney, I was practicing, I was doing my federal lawsuits, my state lawsuits, I was having lots of fun beating the other guy. A pretty amazing record when it comes to litigating. But one day, uh, one of my friends, David Kogelman, uh, who ended up becoming uh, New York State Senate's uh, election law counsel, he uh, called me and said, we just got this weird memo from Microsoft, uh, and they would like to be the software that runs elections in New York State. In fact, they want to be the, the software that runs elections throughout the country. And everyone seems to think it's okay, so what do you think? And I, I think uh, that was my oh my god moment, because I think it was the <laughs> same day that I went on Slashdot where I actually met Ray, and uh, Slashdot was talking about draft Bill Gates for president. Bill Gates was exploring running for president. What a great idea to have a presidential candidate whose software happens to run elections in his own country. Great idea, scared me to death. And so what I did is I said, can I see their memo? And so I, I got their memo, and it had all these points about why we should use closed uh, software. Uh, New York State had a requirement to have escrow software. Uh, or open software, which is basically saying, if you're gonna have code run an election, we wanna actually know what the code says in the event that something goes wrong. So either it's open or it's escrowed. Escrowed basically means we hand it to a third party and then that third party will make the code available in the bizarre situation that something inappropriate occurs. So uh, Microsoft <coughs> was trying to explain why that wasn't necessary, why we should use theirs. Uh, code regardless of whether or not it would be escrowed because believe it or not uh, Microsoft was not interested in escrowing the source code to uh, Windows CE at the time and so I looked at their memo and I saw the logical inconsistencies and instead of going through the whole uh, let's use open source it's great and free software it's great uh, Microsoft is bad as, as may have the knee-jerk reaction I checked the memo for internal consistencies so I remember one, one, my favorite moment, which kind of was the nail in the coffin at the end of the memo was it said, uh, Microsoft indicates that uh, there is an obsolescence associated with free software or open software. And I literally just pasted as my only exhibit uh, the uh, obsolescence schedule for Microsoft Windows products. Uh, and, and as you know, uh, anyone with Windows XP, I believe it's no longer supported by Windows and Windows 98 is no longer supported, Windows 95 is no longer supported. So if you go back, they have planned obsolescence. So when you're buying a voting machine, that's a, uh, the voting machines that were replaced were actually over 100 years old. So uh, the, the lever machines that some of you may remember. So the, the idea of having a system where Microsoft was saying, oh no, it, it, it'll uh, will support the software uh, for as long as you have the machines was just patently not true. So it was a rare opportunity to get to work with the legislatures and tell them, no, really, what you're being told is, is a lie. A and what Ray gets to do, which is working with judges to say, no, really, what the opposing counsel is saying is a lie. And uh, what Professor Sinrock gets to do sometimes, and say, or at least try it in vain to say, like, the concept that uh, you have to crush innovation 
and that it's bad for business is a lie. So it's just having somebody in the room to be part of the negotiation who has enough common sense to say, hey, what we're giving into is, is probably a, uh, a bad idea and uh, we're probably giving up more than we should and uh, we really need to make laws that serve our people. So uh, uh, everyone over the internet, uh, I'm gonna have the speakers give you their uh, Twitter names and uh, for those of you who paid uh, and, and donated for a streaming view, this should be posted shortly and uh, you can tweet uh, questions uh, at our speakers. So if you guys can give your Twitter names. My Twitter name is the same as my, uh, my regular name, Ray Beckerman. Mine is just my first name, Aaron. And uh, thank you.